Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, a podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. Finlay McLaren at chatting underscore fit on Instagram is a strength coach, nutritionist, and podcast host of the Chatting Fit podcast, where he shares knowledge, opinions, and unconventional wisdom from a variety of excellent guests like Dr. Bill Schindler, Dr. Natalie West, Casey Ruff, Dr. Anthony Chaffee, and many more. He's an advocate of low-carb and animal-based diets and excelled in rugby and Olympic weightlifting until injuries curtailed this progression. He also has a master's and bachelor's. Welcome to the show, Finlay. Scott, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, excited. I think we'll have a lot to chat about. Um, You're also an author (laughs) of a book about (laughs) sleep, so I'm sure we'll touch on that uh, because that's a huge passion of mine. But I'd love to just start with with knowing a little bit more about your story. How did you get to um, having such a strong interest in these topics and, and kind of what was your health journey? Sure, sure. So you you did a great in a great job at introing me there. Actually, most of that covers exactly what I am kind of today. But in terms of how I got into, I guess, the world of strength, into the world of nutrition, into the world of kind of health, and now into sort of animal based eating, all started, I guess, when I was about. I'd always been into fitness and health and running. I started as a cross country runner when I was about eight. Um, and then I moved swiftly into rugby and different sports. I was always very sporty and about 13 or 14 years of, at about 13 or 14 years old, I started lifting weights and really got into bodybuilding and kind of athletics. And that sort of started my journey in terms of just understanding what was going to make me bigger, what was going to make me stronger, what was going to make me perform better on the field that followed me through until around 18 or so started play I'd played good standard of rugby up until um, 18 or 19 years old at which point I I'd been lifting weights very badly let's say I uh, I was your classic gym rat so big arms <laughs> big chest not very much on my posterior chain um, and sort of obsessed with the beach muscles so I had a bad back at the time I um, I'd really hadn't excelled my nutrition knowledge much beyond I need to eat as much protein as possible (laughs) and that was that sort of um, carried me through and then I I became a personal trainer at the age of uh, at 18 I um, went to go and work in London where I met a coach called Mike Causa and he really helped to help me get over my first big injury which was that back injury they had I'd had doctors who'd who'd said to me you're going to need surgery on your spine and that would have been a spinal fusion surgery or a discectomy. And I thought I'd, I'd, I'd taken in a number of different um, viewpoints there. And, and some people had said, yeah, it's, you need the surgery. Some people had said, no, no problem. You can do this without surgery. You can, it's just a strength issue. And luckily I engaged enough with the people who said it was a strength issue because I always thought I was strong. I always thought, you know, I'm in the gym. I've got big arms. I've got a big back. I can do a big uh, clean and press. So therefore, I'm, I'm, I tick the box as strong. So I thought it couldn't possibly be a, a strength issue. But my coach at the time, Mike Causa, then showed me how weak I really was in so many different domains of lifting. And that really opened my eyes to what proper strength was and what proper weightlifting and Olympic weightlifting was. So that's when I, I really started to dig into the minutiae of certainly of strength. And from there, I then, uh, I went away from London after a couple of years of being a personal trainer there. I went to study my bachelor's in international business with agricultural trade and food production. I kind of reached a bit of a ceiling in, in, in personal training and I went off to study that. I studied uh, basically in an agricultural university for for a little while. I um, I picked up a knee injury at around the same time of starting that university uh, degree, and that really. So I'd been used to being able to train as much as I'd like, and that really derailed me in many ways because I I I didn't have the full knowledge and the full picture to rehabilitate that knee. And so that took me around 
five years or so to re you know discovering different um avenues for rehabilitation rehabilitating it well um for about three or four three or four months getting into a good state with it and then thinking i was quote unquote fixed and then i would go off and i would injure it again and, and this whole cycle would start again so during that time i started to understand how important my diet was in keeping my body in an optimal shape in order to you know reduce inflammation and give my body the building blocks to actually recover from injury and so i went through these phases of being super highly intense and focused on my nutrition and reading about nutrition and then thinking i was fixed and then sort of almost relapsing into a state of like training as much as possible and you know just the protein matters and I sort of went up and down in these levels so I then I finished my bachelor's still with a knee issue and I went off to get my teeth into nutrition again more so so I went into Bristol University and I studied internet uh, studied nutrition physical activity and public health as a master's and that was great but there was some areas in there which I didn't necessarily agree with a lot of this stuff was focused on the population wide uh dialogue of health where it's you know get plenty of fiber get plenty of grains plenty of fruit and vegetables and you know limit red meat intake which i didn't necessarily agree with at the time but i engaged with it I, this, these were people in a position of authority who are you know they were all doctors they were all professors they were all telling me this is why this is wrong this is why this is right so I engaged with that on that level and I had been slowly drifting away from the bodybuilding and sort of strength world. So there was more of a focus on health. So I was engaging more with that aspect to say what is working for people who are sitting behind a desk for X amount of hours a day. So engaged with that for a little while and then um, finished that master's degree and I went off. There was sort of an impetus to sort of start earning money at that point. I'd been a student for four years, taking on a load of student debt. And I was just thinking, right, I've got a, whatever the job that comes along, I'm going to go into that. So I started selling software in the city of London. And I did that for a year and a half before I pretty much lost my mind sitting behind a desk and smashing out cold calls for eight, nine, 10 hours a day. And, um, and, and then I went to work with a friend of mine in a in a completely unrelated field in trademark software, trademark search software. So again, totally different. Like I, I was still with sort of a drifting away from the health, nutrition, fitness world. And I was still training a little bit, but I, I was so sort of kind of sick of training in a way because of my knee. And I was still just doing what I could in the gym. And it, there was a slight sadness there, I guess, really, because I had been so focused up until the age of 18. And then the injury started slipping in and it was this, this sort of acceptance that, okay, I can't actually perform at the level I want to perform at. So therefore, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to allow myself to sort of drift away from this industry a little bit until the pandemic hit. And that was a real opportunity for me to put a lot of time and effort into how I was going to rehabilitate my knee finally. So there was stuff that I had this level of consistency whereby I didn't have to sit behind a desk the whole day. I didn't have to do X, Y, and Z. I could just focus on um, getting my training sorted, getting my knee rehab sorted. And after that, I really started to re-engage fully with the training side of things. And then that then led on to getting back into the nutrition field. And yeah, so so then eventually I, um, you know, fast forward to today and about, a couple of years ago, I moved to Mexico. That would have been in the middle of the pandemic. And I started re-engaging with um, personal training, health coaching, nutrition coaching. And then again, coming onto people like Dr. Anthony Chafee and Paul Saladino. And I'd heard friends who had tried the carnivore diet. And I thought, you know, there, there's definitely something to this. People who had healed autoimmune issues with the carnivore diet. And I'd I'd been a kid with eczema as well. So which cleared up as soon as I started dropping, especially the processed foods from my diet and dropping um, a, a sort of uh, processed dairy, pasteurized dairy from my diet, dropping gluten from my diet. These things really cleared up my skin issues and my autoimmune issues. So therefore I thought, you know, there's something behind this, dropping nearly everything out in an elimination diet style. And that's what led me down the rabbit hole of 
um, you know, talking to to a lot of doctors, a lot of low carb doctors, a lot of carnivore doctors, and um, and that brings me to where I am today, in a nutshell, where I am talking to you, Scott. Yeah, very cool. Um, and I can certainly relate to the absolute mental toll injuries can take uh, on someone Terrible. as driven as yourself. Um, I've had a host of very bad back injuries myself um, over the years. Um, are you in Mexico now? I am. I'm in Puerto yeah. Vallarta on the Pacific nice. coast of Mexico. Yeah, it looks way too bright to be. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I get sick <laughs> because I, I've, I've, in all of my podcasts, I've got the blinds drawn. Yeah. And it looks like I'm just sitting in sort of a horrible blue light environment, which is true, actually, at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. And um, it's really interesting, um, kind of the progression you had and now coming back to. So, so where does that bring you now? Like you had mentioned the trademark software business mm. and then um, being having a chance to rehab your knee moving to Mexico. Are you a full-time strength coach now or like is that a part-time thing for you? Yeah, so at the moment it's part-time because yeah. I'm focusing on uh, building my podcast and it, uh, getting my teeth into. One of the reasons for moving to Mexico was that the cost of living is just that bit lower. Yeah. So I've been able to give myself really a year of sort of part-time strength and nutrition coaching at the same time as I'm able to research for all my podcast guests. I'm sure you'll have the same you know, vibe. You want to put time yeah. into understanding yeah. your guests before you talk to them. I wouldn't be able to do that if I was still coaching full time, getting into a gym, you know, spending six hours, seven hours a day coaching someone. I just wouldn't have the energy to put into the podcast stuff. So yeah. I'm in a really blessed position to be able to go minimal coaching and training people and a lot of time in the podcast and, and researching. So I'm very yeah. lucky on that area. That's awesome. That's really cool. And um, talking about some of the things you mentioned, like how did... How did you go, first go about like finding out about a carnivore diet and low carb diets? And um, like you had mentioned, you started trying them, started noticing some of the benefits. But like, what brought you to that world? Well, you know, the funny thing is, it's like in hindsight, you look back and you're like, okay, well, I was experimenting with low carb stuff there, but I didn't even realize it. Like there were times in the in the kind of bodybuilding phases of my life that I had in order to get lean, the easiest way I found to get lean was to drop the carbohydrates out of my diet. And you can say, okay, that's just calories in, calories out benefit. I'd agree with that. But it also, it kind of lit me up mentally. Like I was just awake. Like I didn't have any of these stodgy feelings. I, and I was on pretty much, I was always a big spinach guy. You know, I, I was on like steaks, spinach, chicken and spinach, like vegetables, like low carb vegetables and spinach or low carb vegetables and, and chicken or fish and, and, um, a lot, very high protein diet. So at the time that was just came naturally because I was trying to lean up and I was trying to, um, just go high protein in the diet. And then as time progressed, I've realized the sort of value just sort of blindsided by, by podcasts, really like hearing about even Jordan Peterson, it, it eliminating his immune issues and his daughter, Michaela Peterson, eliminating, eliminating her autoimmune issues from the carnivore diet. And it, and it seemed extreme at the time when I first heard it, it was like, whoa, that's extreme. Is that healthy? And, and I had friends who, who had tried it. You know, I got a good friend. He's called you at your Simo on, on Twitter. And he's, you know, a great guy to follow. And he had been trying the carnivore diet for a long time. And he had, live with Paul Saladino for a little bit. And so there was all this sort of connection that sort of to, to sort of swirl in my peripheral view around the carnivore diet. And, you know, I think also trying things like the vegan diet and feeling how terrible I felt on that diet sort of reinforced like, okay, let's go for the exact opposite of this. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you can talk about like some of your experiments, like what you ate and you, you mentioned the eczema, um, inflammation, but what, um, like what have your, your, what have your personal, um, forays into the diet look like and, and what did you find In, into specifically the carnivore diet? Yeah. Carnivore, carnivore or low carb keto. Yeah. Well, I, I'd always found that, I mean, I, I've been sort of a very, <laughs> a very sensitive soul, really. I, um, I've always found that, you know, if I had a, if I had a Coca-Cola or if I had a, um, any of these other sugary drinks, I'd be bouncing off the walls. Or if I had um, a very 
car bridge meal in terms of like pasta or rice like i would just be asleep and because of rugby and sport playing up it was always how i could optimize my performance before the game but often we were told to eat pasta before a game it was like you know you've got to have you know your glycogen stores full and you know you, you've got to have energy for for the game and that just i trained throughout the week you know on a very high protein low carb diet and feel amazing and then at the weekend i was like right got a carb load and i would feel crap before the game it was just like i how i didn't make the connection sooner i don't know but up until 18 i did struggle with severe maybe not severe eczema but certainly worse than you know worse than minor eczema so it's certainly in the insides of the arms and the backs of the legs and it's only got a lot worse in the in the summer and as well with hay fever as well and i noticed that when i removed things like um certainly any of the ultra processed foods and the sugars and anything um as well as broccoli broccoli was always quite inflammatory for me um and as well as milk and pasteurized dairy products and the grains grains in terms of um wheat and um, if I ever had beers as well, I, I don't drink anymore, but if I ever had beer, that was very inflammatory for me. So once I cut the grains out and I would go through periods of three months cutting them out and feeling amazing. And then slowly, you know, I'd say, because oh, I love bread. Bread is delicious. Like that, I, I think if there's a man who says bread is not delicious, you're talking to a liar. So, <laughs> so the, the, there were sort of general experiments like that that I didn't really know I was running I just knew that if I wanted to feel good and if I wanted to really dial in my athleticism and my my thinking ability my ability to think for longer periods of times I needed to cut the carbohydrates out and the carbohydrates generally came in forms that were very grain rich very sugar rich um and and that was the main areas there and then recently going sort of strict carnivore for I do sort of a two week period strict carnivore and then I'll maybe have some low carbohydrate vegetables and then sort of dance around the issue like that but I always feel better when I have the heavy carbohydrates removed and the sugars removed but you know I'm not I'm not a criminal like if I go to the cinema then I will eat popcorn <laughs> yeah I think that's a great approach and I think um <clears throat> Like you mentioned earlier, I think of the carnivore diet as a very helpful elimination diet um, and way of found, finding things you react to. You know, it can be something very simple. You can be like lactose intolerant your whole life and not really know for sure until you do some form of an elimination diet. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of people find that they thrive and feel better than ever if they just stick with only carnivore and other few people feel better or prefer to add more foods back in. and. You know, I'm not dogmatic about that. I think both approaches can totally work and it's it's all about your goals and your situation. You know, if you have like <clears throat> certain autoimmune disorders, you may find you need to be more strict. Um, but for most people, that's not the case. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's totally a spectrum with regards to that. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that that's the thing it's it's also what you have access and availability to like it's been an eye opener that we're very blessed in you know america or england or europe that we have access to really high quality meat and really high quality supplements as well and like i've just realized in mexico the access to good quality meat that you can trust because i don't necessarily trust many of the guys here in the butchers that will say this is grass fed because I'll taste it and I've fed, tasted m many steaks that are grass fed in my time. And, you know, I just can't trust that this is grass fed. So I have to take it with a pinch of salt and I have to take it with a pinch of salt, you know, how old the, the meat is and, and, you know, how long it's been hung and all of this stuff. So I will bring in lots of other elements, you know, just to, um, you know, I'll try and find good supplements and I'll try and find lots of other stuff that sort of ticking the boxes and sort of spreading my risk level in terms of nutrition um you know i felt great the other day when i started adding fish back in i hadn't had fish in a month or two and and little things like that helped me realize oh hang on maybe i was a little bit deficient in something because i was just so heavy on the ribeyes yeah yeah i think that's a great point and um 
talk about the podcast. What was the impetus for starting that? And like, what are you hoping to do with the Chatting Fit podcast? Well, the, the, the impetus there was, I was at a real loose end, you know, the, the, the pod, the, um, the pandemic had, had, was really biting when I started it. It was sort of late 2020. I think my first episode was so that we were in the thick of the pandemic in England, in the thick of lockdowns. I'd stopped me and my business partner at the time, the trademark business had stopped running that business because there was a stage where no one was starting any businesses. So all of our business started, uh, completely drying up. So I just needed something to keep me busy and I wanted to get back into the health, fitness and nutrition world, but I didn't really know how to do it at that stage. So I thought, what, what better than just give myself an opportunity to speak to as many interesting people as possible. And it's very, very difficult to sort of call someone up who's an author or a professor or something and say, can I just talk to you for an hour over the phone? <laughs> But if you, if you're doing it through a podcast and you're doing it because you're, you know, there, there's a sort of mutual benefit there, you're promoting them, they're promoting you. So that really opened my door, opened my world to, to podcasting really. And I really had no idea where it's going to take me. And I still really have no sort of clear, you know, I don't want to take it to a level of advertising. I don't want to take it to a level of listenership at the moment. It's just allowing me to talk to really interesting people, you know, like yourself and like Dr. Bill Schindler and um, Anthony Chafee and Dr. Pran Yoganathan, like people who are, you know, I, I resonate with so much. Like they're talking about liberty. They're talking about freedom. They're talking about what does the research say about animal products? Like animal products do not cause cancer. Like all these pervasive narratives that are stopping people achieving health and that was what i'd really like to do as a personal trainer and as a strength coach and as a nutrition coach was help people achieve health so the podcast has just become a vessel for me to feed my own knowledge and to promote the people that i believe are, 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 sh are putting out a really good valuable lesson yeah that's that's fantastic that's a big probably the main reason I started my podcast um, and what a big part of what's kept it going is just the chance to learn from great people and highlight their stories too. Um, I it's great, isn't it? take pride in the fact that a lot of my guests have never been on a podcast before. <laughs> <laughs> and then often they'll, they'll go on several after yeah. coming on mine. Um, so that's always really fun. You that's know, a good sign. I try to balance it with like the experts and doctors and also like N equals one case studies of people who, um, have overcome or alleviated chronic conditions with yeah. carnivore keto diets. Well, I, I think, I think that's super valuable because so many people overlook the N equals one equation, but, and you know, I, so many, I've had to stop engaging, but people just shouting, you know, where are your randomized control trials? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. We'll just speak to these thousand people over here. who have had incredible results and have cured their diabetes and heart disease and all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, anecdotes can be compelling too uh, as a marketing tool, as we know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to shift topics a little bit and talk about um, your book on sleep. Mm. What um, gave you the idea for that? And, and maybe talk about kind of your own experiences with sleep. Yeah, so sleep is a huge foundation of health. It's, it's also a huge marker in overall health. Like your ability to sleep well is an indication of how well you are overall. And it's a, it's a vicious feedback loop as well, because if you're not sleeping well, that can lead to worse health. So the, each re reinforces the other. So there are sort of, you know, the, the three sort of pillars that I think of, I guess four, if you count sort of, you know, your mental health, but nutrition, physical health in terms of strength and, and muscle and uh, metabolic health and then sleep that's you know the time in your day when you're carrying out many many repair processes your brain is detoxing your um you know your stress levels are coming down your circadian rhythm is being reinforced all of these areas which people neglect many times like they're in front of blue screens the whole day then they're in front then they're under overhead lights in the evening and everything is not conducive to reinforcing your circadian rhythm. And actually, even since writing that book, 
I've interviewed people like uh, Carrie Bennett. She's fantastic. She's called Carrie B Wellness. And she is big on quantum health. So how electrons and how the light affects us in our health sense. And there are many of our metabolic processes that are intertwined with sleep and our circadian rhythm, like our, our stomach microbiome and, and the, the lining on our gut. And I'm going to butcher this because she's the pro on this, this explanation, but we'll renew if our circadian rhythm is well synced after 15 days. So if you're having gut issues and digestion issues, one of the best things you can do for yourself is try and reinforce your circadian rhythm, get to sleep before 12 at night minimum, like because the value of that sleep before 12 at night is has been shown to have an increased amount of value in terms of the amount of time you're sleeping it before 12. So and then waking up as the sun comes up and going to bed, you know, as the sun has come down and, and lowering the light levels, having blue blocking glasses, all of this stuff. But that feeds into overall health in a, in a drastic way that we're not taking into account. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, sleep has been a, a decade long battle for me, trying to improve my sleep. And I'm finally in a place where I'm getting really high quality sleep and it just improves every aspect of my life. What, what have uh, you changed to do that? Um, a lot of things. So uh, obviously I optimize my sleep environment, blackout shades, um, sleeping mask, cool, dark room. Um, I used to use a chili pad. Now I use a Doc Pro, which works better than a chili pad. <laughs> um, What's the Doc Pro, Doc's Pro do? The Doc Pro is like a chili pad, but instead of having like little narrow tubes of water that run through uh, a sheet or a mm. pad, the whole thing is like gel. Oh, wow. So it can get much cooler than a chili mm. pad. Mm. Um, and can you set individuals? So have you got like... I, my no wife eye, doesn't you, use it, so we don't yeah. have the, the you the can dual do one. dual sided ones. Yeah. 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 I just have half a queen. Um, you know, getting certain sheets really help me. Mm -hmm. Um, better pillows, better mattress. Um I have the really, temperature really, is huge. Yeah, temperature is huge. I have really, really bad dust mite allergies. Okay, so yeah, me too. Moving to an apartment with no carpets. Helps a ton and no old furniture. We have only like faux leather furniture that we bought for cheap. Um, good, good. And then, uh, you know, having a great bedtime routine, mm -hmm. meditating before bed, winding down, um, working on my meal timing, getting sunlight first thing in the morning. All those things helped a ton. And then um, for me also, supplementation has helped um, okay, okay. a lot. Yeah. What do you supplement with? So I take... Um, do you know Andrew Huberman? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Huberman so he lab. advocates Amazing. this kind of trifecta of magnesium, threonate, L-theanine, and apigenin. Mm. So I take those three, um, and that's improved my sleep quality. I stay away from things like valerian root, 5-HTP, GABA, because um, mm. that, can, that can backfire um, in a lot of ways, from what I understand. And then I do use melatonin. Um, delayed release and because my problem isn't falling asleep it's staying asleep okay um, and then i also take i'm prescribed trazodone for insomnia oh wow and That's that helps heavy. yeah it's heavy heavy but it helps me a lot it's like yeah. night and day um yeah, yeah. a lot of people find they're like drowsy during the day from it i don't get that at all <laughs> i mm. wake up and i'm like very well Good rested full, full of energy um Oh, and lastly, cutting out coffee made a huge difference. Mm. You don't you don't have any coffee now. No, I don't have any caffeine. Um, I cut it out like three or four years ago. Um, I actually through twenty three and Me, there's a gene you can look at called like the CYPA12 gene. Um, don't quote me on that. You have to look it up. <laughs> but um, if you have a certain variant of it. It's the, ca it's the gene for caffeine metabolism. Mm. So if you have a certain variant of it, of it, you're an ultra slow metabolizer of caffeine. So people always talk about like caffeine has a six hour half-life. That's average. You can, it can, for me, for instance, my half-life is probably like 23 or 24 hours. Oh, wow. So any caffeine 
affect my sleep. Um, and based on aura ring, I went from like 20 minutes of deep sleep a night to like an hour and a half consistently by cutting out caffeine. Wow. Um, and it was very easy for me. I, I actually did it with caffeine pills. I was taking 200 milligrams in the morning. And then I did like three days at 150, three days at 100, three days at 50, and then out. And I had no, no withdrawals. Um, mm. So yeah, those are some of the things I do, but you, you're the author, you wrote the book. So I'd love to hear <laughs> yeah. some of the things that well, I'm, 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 I'm taking notes as you're, yeah. uh, as you're speaking right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 my, my, the main things that have worked for, for me and my clients have been exactly what you've said. It's been like your sleep environment, like how clean is your sleep environment? Only doing, only doing sleep or sex in your bed and your your ability to sleep at night really starts when you wake up in the morning like that's when you start grooming yourself to sleep at night and the bit the most pivotal thing for me and my clients has been waking up early like not allowing yourself to snooze and stay in and getting early light in your eye and that's what Huberman and Huberman Lab talks about as well is getting up, getting outside, walking, getting minimum of three to 20 minutes of sunlight in your eyes as the sun comes up over the horizon. And I think I'm going to butcher this, but we have the suprachiasmic nucleus, which controls the circadian rhythm, and that only responds to certain light frequencies. And so that is where it's so vital to get that light frequency in the morning. And then from there, starting to groom, and some people will argue that you should only have, if you're going to have coffee, have it with your morning cortisol spike. I argue that you should have it later in the day and allow your body's natural cortisol spike in the morning to wake you up and for your melatonin to naturally decrease as we, as we wake up. And then so around 10 or 11 or 12, I'll have my first coffee. And then I'm trying to be outside. I'm trying to be in the light as much as possible, maximizing the amount of vitamin D I'm getting, maximizing the amount of sunlight on my skin. And then in the evening when I'm coming back, not eating too late. So for me, that means three hours before bed, I'm not having any food. And I will have my last coffee exactly that, probably around 1 or 2 p.m. maximum. I like to have a coffee before I work out, and I like to work out in the afternoon. So once I'm getting to the evening, then I'm starting to, you know, change my light environment. That there's uh, again Carrie Carrie Bennett. She talks about the angles of light receptors that we have in our eyes. So we have light receptors lower in our eyes, which sort of register how much overhead light we have. So then, sort of again, this is all signal stuff. Signals to tell us what time of day it is, how tired we should be feeling, what mode our body should be in, what hormones we should be releasing. We're trying to increase the amount of melatonin that's getting ready to re be released, the amount of tryptophan available to be converted into serotonin and dopamine, the amount of um, cortisol we want to try and be reducing. So reducing that stress stuff, reducing the amount of blue screens we have, like even Netflix, I'll try and if I am watching any Netflix in the evening or watching any TV or on my laptop or doing work on my computer or on my phone, then I want to be getting rid of that by nine if I want to be asleep by 10.30. So I'm, it's always a case of preparing for the next stage in your cycle. And this, and this is, it's a little bit, it can feel a little bit complicated when you're first trying to change your circadian rhythm, but it's sort of a case of fake it till you make it. It's like, I feel really tired in the morning, but it, you've got to get up. You're going to feel shit for the first week or two weeks of trying to re-establish a circadian rhythm. And you might get to 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. at night and you think, I'm really awake, can't sleep. Well, you know, turn the light off, try and go to sleep for a bit. If you can't sleep, get up, make yourself a cup of tea, keep the lights low, you know, non-caffeinated tea, whatever it might be. Anything to take your mind off, do a Sudoku puzzle, do something that's very low mental capacity that takes your mind off that frustration of not being able to sleep. Because that's a big one, winding yourself up, being like, why can't I sleep? I'm worried about tomorrow. I'm worried I'm not going to get enough sleep. And that's a reinforcing cycle. So after two weeks or so of waking up at 7 a.m. and getting sun in your eyes, there's going to be very few people who don't, who don't have a circadian rhythm that's going to start responding to that. Those are all excellent tips. And, and uh, having a dog is great for getting that. <laughs> 
first morning mm. walk in. Mm. Um, that definitely. I'm not ready for that responsibility. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> she. My dog has made me very good at getting morning sunlight. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, really interesting. And one thing I forgot to mention that I did that also helped was sleep restriction therapy. So I actually worked with an individual named Greg Potter, who's a PhD in, in sleep um, research. And he put me through, it, it's very common intervention for insomniacs. It's been used since like the 1960s. Um, and there's a like medically established protocol for how you do it. But you basically, if you have a problem with waking insomnia, so you're like waking up a lot, say you're in bed for eight hours a night, but you only sleep for six. What you would do is you would start by only allowing yourself to be in bed for like five and a half hours. And you you can't go to bed before then and you have to get out of bed after that amount of time. And then like every week or two weeks, you add like 30 minutes to the time you're allowed to be in bed. And what that's supposed to do is you get so tired mm. from the restriction that your sleep efficiency improves. So you go from in bed for eight, sleeping for six hours, which is 75% efficiency mm -hmm. to, you know, close to a hundred percent. And then you only add time if it stays mm -hmm. efficient. That, um, that's interesting. I think that's, that's half the premise behind the, the sort of inverted commas, fake it till you make it. Yeah, it's like, exactly. regardless, think of it. regardless, get up at 7 a.m. or get up at 6.30, whenever the sunlight is coming up. And it doesn't matter if you've only slept for two hours, yeah. like just get out of bed at that time you're going to yeah. be so tired by the night that your body can't fail to yeah. like after time sleep it's yeah. just programmed to like you've got to keep this it's yeah. like when you're when you're jet lagged you're flying to australia or you fly into one of these countries where your time zone is totally different and you're so tired and it's 2 p.m in the afternoon if you succumb to that want to sleep then you're never going to get over your jet yeah, lag you're screwed. yeah you're screwed you've got to wait until 9 or 10 p.m when your body's so tired that it's going to have a block of sleep. Totally agree. Well, this has been fantastic, Finn. Really appreciate you taking the time. Um, like I said, I think we have a lot of mutual interests and um, it's really cool to, to meet you. Um, where can folks find you? And, and I'll have links to everything in the show notes as well. So the best place is Instagram or YouTube. Just type in at chatting fit. So on YouTube, it's chatting fit, all one word. And on Instagram, it's chatting underscore fit. And then my personal page is at Finley underscore squats. Awesome. I'll have links to all of that cool. in the show notes and really appreciate your time. Thanks for doing it. I love it. You too. And we're going to have you on the chatting fit podcast any day now. Okay, great. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out and share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at carnivorecast or go to carnivorecast.com. You can also email me at info at carnivorecast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.